welcome to Monday Night Reading. I'm thrilled to welcome Sarah Thurber and Blair Miller, the authors of Good Team, Bad Team, which hits the shelves tomorrow in mere hours, actually. <laughs> um, this is Monday Night Reading. And before we get deeper into Good Team, Bad Team and Sarah and Blair, I just want to share with you why we do this. So Monday Night Reading is uh, born of my frustration that nonfiction authors don't get as many opportunities, in fact, pretty much zero, opportunities to read from their books as fiction authors do when it's time for their book to be released. So I decided to create this for you. I really need to shout out one of our regulars here, Joe Munich. Hi, Joey. <laughs> Joey comes every Monday night reading. And for me, this is special because the, I got it came, I call it Monday night reading because when I was a playwright back in Minneapolis, Monday night reading was the night that you would have your work read. Sometimes it was brutal. This is not going to be that. <laughs> uh, you would have feedback. And, and it, I was lucky enough to have a few Monday night readings. And Joey was actually in the audience back then when I was just a... 19, 20, 21, super, super baby. So I'm so glad that Joe comes every Monday night to support these authors and just loves hearing it, just loves hearing it. Um, the reason I wanted to shout him out and also just mention why we do this is because it's our last one of the season. We take a summer hiatus. Uh, we need to take a little break from it. We'll be back in September, but what a perfect way for us to kick off the last of our Monday night readings with Sarah and Blair. This is a rite of passage for a lot of top three book workshop students. Um, they both are alums of that program. And I'm so happy to have you here. Before we dig in, we have to have Laura's introduction. Laura Stone. I would be thrilled. So first you need to know audience that Sarah and Blair are married still even <laughs> after writing a book together. And you may say that that was the ultimate test drive of their content, that they truly know a thing or two about team building and team keeping. They are foundational to Foresight, Blair, co-founder, and Sarah, managing partner. Foresight is a training company dedicated to the science of good thinking. Foresight develops research-based creativity and innovation tools, assessments, and training designs proven to help individuals, teams, and organizations solve complex problems more effectively. In the last 10 years, Blair pioneered the fusion of creative problem solving techniques with traditional cost optimization methods, helping his clients deliver in excess of 1.3 billion with a B in savings. Blair has co-authored numerous books and publications, including Creativity Unbound, which has been used by graduate programs in creativity and translated into three languages. Sarah is co-author of Creativity Unbound, an introduction to creative process, and Facilitation, a door to creative leadership. She wrote her latest book, The Secret of, highly, of the Highly Creative Thinker, with her Danish colleague, Doite, yes, Nielsen, with whom she also developed the visual foresight model. She's also a heck of a field hockey coach. The two live in Evanston with their three children, and I'll leave how you can stay connected with them in the chat. AJ? Okay, so good team, bad team is out tomorrow, everybody. So this is this is a call to arms right now, okay? Tomorrow is the release date. It would be amazing if you would please order this book. You're going to see there's the link in the chat. Laura will actually be putting that in the chat throughout the evening. So if you lose the place, it's no problem. This helps Sarah and Blair if you order today or tomorrow. Today would be better. Give them a little bit of a spike. We also really need you to review this book. And I want to challenge you. Can you just do it this week, please? Because here's the thing. If you buy the, and by the way, you can review the book even if you didn't buy it, but we do want you to buy it. But you can, it's a myth. You can absolutely do it. You don't have to, uh, if yours is already on the way or if you got it by another means, you know, it's okay. You can go ahead on Amazon and leave the review. But I'm pushing this because if you, you'll tell yourself, I'm going to review that. And if you don't do it this week, you're absolutely going to forget. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a little trick. All right. Tonight, 
Sarah's going to read from the book. Blair and Sarah are going to, uh, I'm going to ask them a bunch of questions. They're going to answer them. What you're going to see in the chat, uh, regulars do this, so I, we hope you'll follow suit. People putting in lines they love, concept, concepts that resonate with them, uh, something that they learned that they loved in the chat, which, by the way, we give the chat to the authors. This is a nice thing for them, so please contribute in the chat. But you can take that that little piece of something that you loved and turn that into review. It doesn't. It's, we're not talking New York Times review here. We're just talking simple, please, five stars. I'm just going to do it. They can't ask you that. I can. Um, and then just a little something about what you loved about the review, which incident or about the book. Instantly, you can also change reviews. So I know I'm going hard on this, but that's because I, they need this. They need a bunch of reviews in the first week. So call to arms. Launch day tomorrow. Buy a copy. Buy one for someone you know. Please, please, please leave a review. All right. That's my plug. We do not do constructive criticism in Monday Night Reading. We do all love. So in the chat, please share when you're listening what you loved, lines you like, that sort of thing. I think that's all my housekeeping. Is that about it, Laura? Yeah? Okay. Uh, Sarah, please. Um, you know I'm going to ask you the questions I ask you all through class. I want to ask you, who, for whom did you write this book? And I, because... It's written in the first person, so I'm the one that has to read all the reading. I'm going to give it to Blair so he can answer these questions. Okay, so Blair, for whom did you write Good Team, Bad Team? Our reader is a leader with big goals who ends up spending more time dealing with people challenges than with the challenges that would help them reach their goals. Okay, and what, and, is, what is your core message for that reader? Well, the core message is that the best way to solve your people challenge is to teach your people to solve any challenge together. Our, the promise of reading this book is to give you proven tools to harness the diverse thinkers on your team, take on big challenges, and get surprisingly great results. Awesome. Those are book fundamentals, and they are stellar. Okay, Sarah, who's going to set up the excerpt so we know what you're reading first? So I'll set it up. And first of all, can I just say so many of the people on this call are people who have really helped us put this thing together. And oh my gosh, that is such a lovely thing to, to be reading to you. So thank you for coming. Um, so the first thing we're going to read, the first thing I'm going to read is uh, the introduction, which kind of encapsulates a lot of what's in the book and why it got written and who the players are. Um, and you will notice that there are a couple of characters in the book, namely myself and Blair. And that was a that was really the brainchild of AJ of AJ, who really helped us figure out how to not write a book about something. We we're gonna write about foresight and thinking preferences. You usually go, oh no, oh no, you don't. You're gonna write a book for someone and you're gonna be in it. So the um, so we're in it, and that's why. But I'll read you the introduction, and I'm actually going to read it on my screen so that I can be looking up. Introduction. Drop your weapons. I first discovered team building was a thing on a blind date. I had just turned 30 and was traveling the world as an independent freelance writer, editor, and designer. My friends, who occasionally describe me as the most single person I know, thought it might be time for me to settle down. You'll love Blair, said my friend who set up the date. He's tall, smart, handsome. He has a master of science in creativity and does team building for a living. I was dubious about the career choice, but agreed to go on the basis of tall, smart, and handsome. We went out for Thai food. By the time they cleared the noodle plates, I found myself leaning in, fascinated by Blair's insights into teams. Like any good freelance writer, I dropped into interview mode. How did you get into team building? I asked. Blair had been a camp counselor, teacher, drama coach, and outward bound instructor. In graduate school, he'd studied how to facilitate groups through complex problems. He rolled it all into a career as a team consultant. So um, what happens in one of your team building workshops? It was the mid 1990s when trust falls and ropes courses were all the rage. 
and Flair was right on trend. He took teams out of their offices and gave them physical challenges they could overcome only by working together. Does it help? I asked. It does, he said. People find themselves in a new context, facing new challenges as a team. They start to see each other in a new way. I must have looked skeptical. I remember one guy, he said, good-naturedly drawing me into a story. He was a Vietnam vet. He worked with a high-tech manufacturing team. And on the first day of the workshop, I noticed him paying close attention when I read the suggestions for working together. The morning of the last day, he took me aside and confessed, I worked with this team for years. This is the first day I've ever come to work without my knife. A knife? Like a real knife, I stammered. Blair laughed, delighted to have cracked my professional veneer. I know, crazy, right? But we're all hardwired for survival, he said. For him, that knife was a symbol of self-protection. He would brought it to work every day. He brought it a knife to work for years. What made him stop? He finally trusted his team, Blair said simply. He had no reason to mistrust them but he didn't trust them either. The physical challenges we did together in the workshop showed him he could trust his team. So he left his knife in the car. Team building was getting more interesting by the minute. Clearly, if you knew what you were doing, you could have a big impact on a team in a short amount of time. If you could cause someone to stop carrying a physical weapon, what other emotional and intellectual armor could you get them to drop? As a writer, you can always tell if someone is truly passionate about their subject. Blair practically glowed when he talked about teams. People walk away from those workshops with new faith in their teams, he said proudly. Then he hesitated. The problem is that the halo effect eventually wears off. People go back to work and fall into old habits. You can't expect companies to run outdoor team building workshops every month. I wish you could. Well, so what will you do? I asked, a little concerned. I'm experimenting with a new approach. I've been wondering, is it the trust falls and ropes courses that actually transform teams? Or is it the simple act of solving big challenges together? He dedicated his graduate studies to finding out. He did research to see what had the biggest impact on teams. He found that the physical experiential challenges he led in his outdoor workshops increased trust. The work-related problems that he did facilitating in meetings increased team cohesion and clarity. Why not combine the best of both? That did it. Blair began to combine experiential activities with real-world problem solving. It became his signature style. He brought teams together around conference tables instead of ropes courses and mixed creative problem solving with engaging group challenges. These days, I build teams by having them solve real problems, he said. It's a win for the client. It's a win for the team. Sometimes I miss the outdoor ropes courses and trust falls. He looked a little wistful. Then he cracked a conspiratorial grin. Then again, my liability insurance got a whole lot cheaper. After our first date, which Blair sometimes wryly refers to as the interview, he became my favorite interview subject. We were married a year later. Can I stop there? If you like. I was just gonna stop there for a check in. Yes, do you, you, sure, yeah, if you wanna check. Did you want me to go to a question now rather than continue with the introduction? Sure. Okay, my question is about another part of the introduction. So let me check a different question. My question, uh, I'm gonna have to go on the fly because my questions are about what the end of the introduction and that's- Oh, cool. okay. You want me to keep reading? reading? No. I can do it. No, yeah, we're gonna do it because- go No, go I wanna know um, how, I mean, what I, you brought, okay. You stopped at the end of the blind date. So this is now what you get. So I'm just gonna tell you. Um, Why did you- why did you have a second date with Blair? I know that's not what the book is about, but you just stopped there. So why did you have a second date? It was just so clear to me that we weren't done having the conversation. I mean, there was just so much there to unpack. He was so he, extraordinary. I mean, he it just, he was an extraordinary person. And at that point, it wasn't even like, 
all romance. It was a little romance, but it was, it was really just, I mean, I wasn't done meeting him. So Blair, then for you, my question for you is, do you feel like, I mean, this, your married life, you have three adult children. So you, you've been having the same conversation for decades and now there's a book. So do you, does it feel like you're still on the same date? I mean, I'm just wondering, you're still having the same conversation? It's it's really funny because it, 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 I wanted the second date because we went dancing that night. <laughs> and, you and that out. <laughs> we went walking around. We saw some Frank Lloyd Wright buildings that night. Uh, there were some things that were just this. <laughs> um, so, um, but it. Your volume just went out, Kel. Writing writing this book did bring up moments of the interview <laughs> mode again that uh, sometimes a little uncomfortable. <laughs> so because you, so this brings up a good point, is you are co-authors. And so Sarah, part of Sarah's job was uh, writing, but also talking to you about pulling stories from you and asking you questions and asking for clarity and Sarah's, you know, part of the business, but it's still, I think you had a lot of conversations that, you know, when you're doing this work, maybe you aren't thinking about anymore because it's so part of your daily life, but you have to extract all of this for the book, for the person who doesn't know anything about it. And that's where actually living, you know, being married was good because honestly, we wake up in the morning, Sarah meditates, I get a cup of coffee and uh, really, for the better part of three years, we would talk over what writing had happened the day before, where were we going, and uh, what story or or what theory, what model should fit here. And mm. it's really uh, useful to have that as an ongoing conversation. Uh, so so it wasn't really truncated. We didn't have to, you know, wait for days and days to uh, work out a passage uh, or, or, you know, a sentence sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, and I'm so impressed with how the two of you um, stayed true to what was important to you in this process. I mean, obviously, it was not a fly on the wall in your home, but it seemed like you were a team in creating it. Was that, would you agree that you- I would agree. And and I think our skills are so different. I mean, I came into the thing as a freelance writer with a, a background in professional writing. So it was sort of like, I was like, I, I'm going to write, you know, I'll write. Uh, it wasn't, we didn't spend a lot of time thinking, okay, you write a chapter, I write a chapter. Like I was going to write it. But when I first, when we first got together, I would sit down and, you know, tape Blair talking about a story. He's a great storyteller. So I'd tape him talking about stories and then go up and, you know, refine it and make it into print. And um, and then we'd string things together that in, in a way that was really funny. So we really did bring our best selves into the book and sort of fuse it all in. That is evident. And now I want you to finish reading the introduction <laughs> to Good Team, Bad Team. Sound good? That sounds good. I and I, secretly, I, I had to stop in part because I couldn't see everybody when I was reading my screen. So now I can see everybody. All awesome. Right. All right. Better teams. So this is part two of the introduction. Better teams through science. Blair spent the next 30 years traveling the globe nonstop, supporting teams in global 1000 companies. I called him the team whisperer. He trained and facilitated teams who had to innovate new products, solve problems, cut costs, develop strategic plans, and improve productivity. His unique approach helped companies make and save billions of dollars, not millions, billions. That's the impact good teams can have. Organizations that invest in good teams know that secret. The payback on good teams is rich. During his career, Blair never stopped looking for new research-based ways to unlock team performance. The biggest breakthrough came in the late 1990s when his friend Gerard Puccio, PhD, a professor at Blair's graduate program at the State University of New York, Buffalo State University, 
discovered a scientific way to measure cognitive style differences. Gerard called them thinking preferences. These thinking preferences could predict someone's behavior as they work through a complex challenge. Gerard developed a valid, reliable self-assessment and called it the Problem Solving Style Indicator, PSSI, or PISI. Blair immediately recognized its value to teams. Gerard, my clients could really use this insight, he said. But do you have to call the assessment the PISI? They partnered on a business venture and renamed the assessment the Foresight Thinking Profile. The Foresight Assessment measures how people think not how well they think, but how they like to think. With foresight, you can anticipate how people will approach a challenge. You understand where their energy is likely to rise and fall as they work through it. Like any good assessment, foresight gives the gift of self-awareness, helping people understand how do I approach a challenge. Unlike other assessments, it also gives the gift of process awareness, helping them understand what's the best way to approach a challenge. Discovering your thinking preferences unlocks a common language for groups to solve problems. When I married Blair, I was still living the independent life of a freelancer. A few, a few years later, I was a wife, a mother, a business partner, and a school volunteer. Suddenly, I was always on a team. And before long, I was asked to lead teams. I led committees, event teams, sports teams, and volunteer organizations. Knowing about thinking preferences gave me a distinct advantage. As a team leader, I knew what would energize people. I knew where they might get stuck. I knew where conflicts might arise and how to reduce them. My publishing background came in handy at Foresight, where I helped to write, edit, design, and produce Foresight's first interpretive guide, which would ultimately be translated into nine languages and support collaborative problem solving in teams around the globe. In January 2010, Blair and Gerard asked me to lead the company as managing partner. I did what my years with Foresight had taught me to do. I built a good team. That's easy to write. It was hard to do. Leading a good team did not all come naturally. As you'll see in the next chapter, it came in fits and starts. Sometimes it came kicking and screaming. Mostly it came from trying and failing and finally applying the research-based insights you'll learn in this book. They are insights I learned not only from Blair, but also from team building experts, researchers, and leaders around the world. Team building was my business and they were my clients. Good is the goal. This book will guide you on the journey to lead a good team. The upside is that if you follow this path, you'll soon be on a good team. Good is the goal. It was tempting to write about great teams or amazing teams. After all, who doesn't want an amazing team? By comparison, good seems a little apologetic. But think about this for a minute. If you had good health, a good relationship, a good living, a good home, good friends, good neighbors, a good education, good parents, and good kids, your good life, would be amazing, right? Who sold us that bill of goods that good isn't good enough? As a mother of three, I suspect that much of the anxiety, depression, and isolation that plagues our kids stems from the fact that we dangle our amazing moments in front of everyone on social media and keep the ho-hum, oh crap moments to ourselves. Nobody can live up to amazing day in and day out. A good team doesn't worry too much about being amazing. Instead, they show up every day, or almost every day, and do the work without fail, or nearly without fail. Life happens, so does failure. The point is that a good team isn't perfect. It's good, and that's what's so good about it. People on a good team know their purpose. They trust each other. They know how to solve challenges together. A good team can remain good for a long time long time and bring great joy and satisfaction to all the people it touches. It can deal with breakdowns and recover. And when it's called upon to be great, it can rise to the challenge. Like many books about teams, this one has some familiar advice. Lead with purpose, build trust, and work together to achieve goals. Here's what makes it different. 
Good Team, Bad Team draws on a proprietary database that contains over 6 million data points on cognitive diversity collected through the Foresight Thinking Profile Assessment. This data and the research it inspired will help you understand why people approach challenges so differently and how they can work together with less conflict and achieve goals faster with better results. Good Team, Bad Team is loaded with practical tips, science-driven insights, and real-world stories. The tips are proven, the insights are research-based, and the stories are all true, although we have changed names and a few details to preserve the anonymity of our clients. The book unfolds in three parts. One, know yourself. Discover your own problem-solving style so you can lead yourself and others more effectively. Two, know your team. Learn how team purpose, trust, and climate can move the dial on collaboration, motivation, and performance. Number three, know your challenge. Share a common language to solve complex problems so your team can tackle any challenge. This book will guide you to create a good team with the people you have. If you have a good team now, kudos. This book will help you understand why it's working and how to keep a good thing going. If not, take heart. A good team is something you can make on purpose. The ingredients are simple, and if you combine them with care, authenticity, and compassion, the results are almost guaranteed. This approach works for multinational corporations, government agencies, startups, nonprofits, classrooms, clubs, and committees, as well as for remote, hybrid, and in-person teams. It even works for sports teams. Wherever groups of people commit to create a common goal, this approach comes in handy. It will guide you to create a ha healthier, happier, more connected team. But chances are, you didn't come here just for that. You came here looking for better results. Don't worry, you'll get those too. By the end of this book, you will know how to create a team that can focus its diverse problem-solving powers and together achieve unexpectedly good, dare we say, amazing results. Yay. Okay, so that's my cue. I wanted to ask you about good team versus extraordinary team. And early on in the writing process, you made that very, very clear. So I'm just wondering if either of you would like to elaborate on why, I mean, we get it from what you shared, but I still think some people would say, well, I still want, you know, I know you said it's good is good enough, but really, you know, why is that so important that we stop fixating on this extraordinary piece? I'll go really quickly first, but I think Blair's going to weigh on in that. And I think, you know, for me, the idea of raising children you're not, you're not trying to raise extraordinary children. Like what kind of pressure is that? You're trying to raise good people. You know, you're trying to, to make a life that works in, in real every day, every interaction terms, like that you get extraordinary results. Great. But I feel like the bar um, for everyday connectivity I feel like good is a generous bar because it allows flex. And frankly, you can't get too amazing if you don't go through good. So do you feel like people don't, do you feel like people miss how great, how good their team is? Cause they're so fixated on making it this super team. Yeah. I mean, I was asked to do a webinar for the OD network and that was great. And I said, well, you know, if this book, what, what would you like me to talk about? And they said, could you talk about how to speed the path to high performing teams? <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. I can do that. <laughs> but, but that is what people in organizations are sort of trained to go at. And mm -hmm. you can't get to that point without going, without having good to take you there. You can't just arrive at amazing or, or high performing without being good. Yeah. Did you want to add anything, Blair? Oh, just a little bit. And and that is that uh, I, 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 I've been in the around teams, you know, uh, throughout the 80s, 90s, 2000s. And it seems like it's it's always coming around to be extraordinary, to be amazing. You know, do, oh, my gosh, there, there's some secret sauce. And uh, and that really 
the the ingredients for having really good relationships, or at least relationships with people you're working with, um, they're 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 not necessarily these things that we have to go to school on and 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 oh my gosh, strive really high every day. They're uh, you know, have gratitude and uh, say thank you. And when someone does something wonderful, right, AJ? Like, mm -hmm. what are the guidelines of this group? Hey, when someone does something, we're going to talk about uh, uh, how grateful we are and 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 point it out in detail mm -hmm. what was wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, they sound so basic, like that can't be it. But, you know, you do that over and over. And before you know it, you're doing the, <laughs> wait, we're doing great things. We're achieving remark. Where was, where was the fairy dust? Well, the fairy dust was in treating each other well. And then the laughter picks up and the ease increases. And uh, what do you know? What I mean, do you, I love you know, think of what it means in this group. You know, AJ, you're not telling us, hey, your first draft really ought to be something. I mean, you got to work hard enough. So your first draft is the the bomb. You know, no, actually, you got to make a shitty first draft. Like that just, it just makes everybody feel, okay, oh, I can definitely do that. I think I can do that, you know? And and then you're in and then you realize, oh, I could actually make it better. And But it's really that generosity of like, a team is a creative act. You know, you have to create a good team and you have created a team, a good team here. And it's one of the things that made writing this book tolerable because I'm not that antisocial, you know, I mean, it was helpful to have a community to do it. Um, I, I love really that you said, you said tolerable, made writing this book tolerable. <laughs> that was the operative word. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. And incidentally, I say, don't just write a shitty first draft, write the shittiest, <laughs> just the worst possible thing you could write. That's that's how we can take take our expectations down. And Okay, I like this parallel. I think that's interesting. I do want to mention thinking preferences because you brought that up in the introduction. And when you first started explaining it to me in class and in one-on-ones, I was like, wow, okay. So just to be clear, I do not enjoy any personality test ever. So I don't know my num my letters of this and my what I am of that. I don't care. I might have taken the test. I don't know. But what I liked about learning about foresight was just respect for the way other people think about things. Or like you say, want, prefer to think about them. Except the thing I don't like about the personality test is it feels fixed to me. Because like, I'm this and you're that. And okay, give me, you know, let me, I don't want to be in the box. I don't want to be in the box. But what I learned from you is that this is a preference, not a fixed state. Can you speak about that? Why the word preference versus you are this thing? Sure. Um, do you want to do that, Blair? Go ahead. Go ahead. You, you got it. Well, the nut of the research that Gerard did was that when you solve a complex problem, it doesn't just require you to think hard. It requires you to tap four really different kinds of thinking. You have to clarify, like, what is the problem? So you're solving the right problem. You have to ideate to come up with ideas to solve it. So, you know, you clarify, you ideate, and then you have to take the best ideas and develop them. But that's still not enough. Like a solution won't get you there. So you clarify, you ideate, you develop, and then you take your solution and implement it. And it's those four types of thinking, clarify, ideate, develop, and implement, that can get you a home run solution. Simple, science-based, works every time. Really, there's just one problem with it. Users. Because when human beings try to do that, our brains unconsciously play favorites. So that's fine. You know, you may grab on. I like to, I like to ideate. So I grab on and ideate first. And if I can come up with an idea that solves it, yay, yay me. 
<laughs> but if I can't, then I'll go start doing the other stages. And as long as I do all four types of thinking, I'll get a home run solution. The problem is if we're all working together and I grab on a one and you grab on a different one, we start wrestling the problem and end up wrestling each other. And that's miserable. So the whole notion of preference versus, you know, capability is we're all capable of all four of those types of thinking, but you can measure, you can literally measure which ones you like better than others. And with the awareness, then you can shift your behavior and you can understand what others are trying to contribute that's been bothering you all this time. Realize like, actually, they're trying to help in a way that I don't like that part. I don't like doing that kind of thinking. They're doing it. And I don't like them. You know what I mean? Like suddenly it takes all of the negative labels that we have for how other people are approaching a challenge and helps us realize like, oh, they're actually trying to do the stuff I don't like. That could be very useful. We should maybe work together. Um, and the, the idea that it is a preference just means it's what you unconsciously gravitate toward. It's not your fate. It's not the only thing you can do. In fact, it's definitely not the only thing you should do. It's just what you're going to want to do without being conscious of it. Perfect explanation. I love that. And in this way, I feel like this book is accessible, right? Because a lot of us don't want to be put in the box. Incidentally, before you do the next uh, excerpt, I've got to show everybody. Let's see if I can do it. Uh, I don't think I can do it justice. So you wanted this from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you scroll through it, let's see. I just I can, I can share a screen. Maybe. It's um it's okay. I'll just show a little. So throughout the book, there's a lot of visual um graphics, contextual models, really, really helpful um drawings doodles um all sorts of things for all sorts of learning that's what I like I like a book to be accessible to people with all different learning styles so your book is does that so well um I know that you had a vision for it is this the vision you had yeah is I have to say you know we said to the uh, art director and we work with page two and they were great and part of the reason we work with them is because well, we think we maybe could have gotten a book deal. The notion of having a collaborative relationship with our publisher was super important to us. I mean, we really wanted to co-create this book. And going in, Blair and I said, we want the book, obviously, to be a really good book to read. But we want it to be an object, like, that you would love to hold this book and page through it. And there would be places, there would be pull quotes and, you know, places to stop and funny images that show progress, like good progress, bad progress. And you just things where you could get the gestalt of what the book was about without reading it. So that somebody could be at a bookstore and say, oh, I love that. And see a picture and be like, oh, I get that. And start reading a paragraph and be like, I'm buying this. You know, it was, I we wanted the book to be an object. And we said that specifically to our publisher. And, and honestly, by the end of writing it, we still didn't, we just still hadn't seen any of those spreads. I penciled them all out. Like Blair and I had, you know, together, we'd come up with dozens of these spreads, but, and some were great. And some were like, oh no, I'm not going in the book, you know, cut. But um, by the end of writing, I was almost too just tired to do them. And we, then we were like, okay, no, we're not going to sacrifice that. We're going to, we're going to, bring it, you know, we're going to really make a push for that. And we did have to make that sort of come back to it and push it. But it's one of my favorite parts of the book. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I'm so glad you stuck with that vision. All right. So let's do our next excerpt. And I believe you said it's going to be chapter three. Chapter three. All right. Chapter three, go from hands-on to hands-in leadership. As a leader, your thinking preferences are your superpower, right up until they become your kryptonite. Letitia was your classic high achiever. She left her career as a top salesperson at a Fortune 500 company when she had kids and started to volunteer at their school. That's where we met. 
every day I pulled up to the carpool line riding a bike with a trailer and wearing whatever doesn't smell or have spots on it. And Letitia pulled up in her BMW wearing designer sportswear. She had it together. When she was asked to chair the, the school marketing committee, no one was surprised. Letitia liked her fellow volunteers, but they lacked her drive for results. Most of them were volunteering in order to meet other moms. Letitia was there to get things done. For her, the tasks were easy and familiar. She took a hands-on approach. She took over projects that dragged and finished work that was incomplete. She felt energized every time she crossed something off her list. But she didn't notice that instead of being grateful, her team was getting miffed. One friend confided in me, Letitia's kind of taking over. She seems to want to do everything on the marketing committee. Fine with me. I'm happy to let her do it. My friend started to show up late, then to miss meetings altogether. She wasn't the only one. Other team members also disengaged. Before long, Letitia found herself doing the work of five people. Under those conditions, even capable, competent Letitia was overwhelmed. Her team had evaporated, but what could she do? They were all volunteers. Compared with Letitia, I was a committed underachiever in the volunteer department. I was up to my eyeballs at home with three little kids and a traveling husband. When the call for volunteers went out, I begrudgingly signed up to be the assistant to the headroom parent of Ms. Young's first grade class. I thought I could handle that much. Kim, our headroom parent, knew the ropes. Imagine my dismay when three weeks into the school year, Kim took me aside and said, listen, I just got a full-time job. I need you to take over as headroom parent. I remember where I was standing. I was suddenly rooted to the spot. I must have looked ashen because she patted me on the shoulder. Don't worry, she said, leaning in and lowering her voice. This job is easy. You just have to know how to do it. She had my attention. There are a limited number of events to put on during the school year, she continued. You don't have to run them all. You just need to sit down over coffee with Ms. Young and decide on the dates and then assign each event to a different parent. At that point, I must have given her a disapproving look. Wasn't she supposed to run all the events? Believe me, she insisted. It's good for the other parents. It gets them involved in their kid's class. It's good for you, too, because all you have to do is meet with Ms. Young once and watch the whole year unfold. This felt like cheating. But given my circumstances, I followed her advice to the letter. It was brilliant. We had a banner year. Everyone was involved. Parents, students, Ms. Young. We all loved it. We were a good team. The next year, I volunteered to be headroom parent again. And the year after that, I followed Kim's advice every year, enlisting the help of lots of parents to get everyone involved. Before my kids finished grade school, I'd been voted president of the parent volunteer committee twice. By this time, Letitia and I had become fast friends and workout buddies. She was conditioning for a triathlon. Of course she was. Ever the overachiever, Letitia had outgrown her role on the marketing committee. She told me she was being groomed to take over as president of the school board. Her term would begin in the fall. On weekends, we'd bike up along Chicago's North Shore. As I pedaled hard to keep up with her, Letitia and I talked about our families, our friends, and our jobs. I told her about the foresight assessment. Do you think the assessment could help me in my upcoming leadership role? Her voice, normally self-assured, was anxious. She was nervous about running the school board. It was a big job, and she wasn't entirely happy about the way the marketing committee had turned out. She was looking for a better way to lead. Yes, you should take the assessment, I replied. Your thinking preference is showing. When you lead a team, you have goals to meet and people to manage. You have to give assignments, clarify roles, communicate vision, fix problems, build systems, track trends, set strategy, and put out countless large and small fires along the way. Oh, plus your own work. There's no way to get it all done. So you have to choose where to focus. If you're not careful, your thinking preferences will choose for you. 
you'll naturally gravitate toward working toward work that aligns with your thinking preferences and skip work that doesn't. A thinking preference can be a huge asset in your role as a leader. It's like your own problem-solving superpower. It gives you extra energy for certain types of work. When your energy, where your energy goes, your focus follows. See if you recognize any of these behaviors in your own leadership style. Leaders who prefer to clarify tend to focus on roles, structure, purpose, and defining current reality. They like to be organized and prepared to give clear directions. When a challenge arises, they clarify to be sure they're going to address the right problem. Then they'll spend time thinking it through. They are reliable, realistic leaders whose predictable behavior builds trust on teams. However, sometimes they get so caught up in the need to gather more information that progress grinds to a halt. Leaders who prefer to ideate tend to focus on future visions, innovation, change, new products, original approaches, and grand gestures. They're fun, playful, imaginative, and full of surprises. They foster exploration, celebrate new ideas, and try new things. But eyes roll when they come back from the latest conference with a whole new business model or a shiny new idea that requires everyone to shift focus again. Leaders who prefer to develop tend to focus on optimizing solutions that are consistent and compliant. They're meticulous, detail-oriented, which sometimes causes them to be nitpicky when it comes to others' ideas. If they commit to a particular solution, they like to pursue it to perfection, giving it all their time and attention. Sometimes this narrowing of focus can end up dragging the whole team down a rabbit hole with diminishing returns. Leaders who prefer to implement tend to focus on results. They like to get things done. And if others move too slowly, they may just do it themselves. They deal in deadlines, checklists, goals, and quotas. They're persistent, confident, and willing to try and fail and try again. And they like to be in charge. But if their preference to implement takes over, they can steamroll over others and steamroll right past, clarify, ideate, and develop, and act before things are fully thought out. You may recognize yourself in one or more of these preferences. Again, most people have just one preference. Others have two or three. The most common thinking preference is implement. About 33% of people in the general population have implement as one of their thinking preferences. Here's the shocker. About 58% of leaders do. It makes sense. People who prefer to implement like to get results. They have a bias for action and an abundance of confidence, and they like to be in charge. Their can-do attitude and push for results means organizations will often put them in charge. That doesn't guarantee they'll be good leaders. That depends on their ability, not their thinking preference. In fact, many leaders have to overcome aspects of their implementer preference to become good leaders. The power of hands-in. When Letitia arrived at our offices, I handed her the results of her foresight thinking profile. It was a one-page printout with a simple graph at the top and a short paragraph below. Look at the graph first, I instructed. Those four dots show how much you prefer to clarify, ideate, develop, and implement. Those are the four types of thinking you need to solve a challenge. Now, look at the line that connects the dots. That shows how your energy will ebb and flow as you work through the problem-solving process. It's like your own personal energy wave. Letitia's graph looked like a giant check mark. She had a low preference to clarify, an even lower preference to ideate, a slightly less low preference to develop, and soaring above the rest was a single high preference to implement. Letitia's foresight profile was implementer. This explained her, la her laser focus on tasks. Letitia liked to get things done. She glanced at the graph and shrugged. Yeah, that seems right. Read the description, I suggested. I'm going to abbreviate this. Implementers like to make things happen. They are action-oriented and take pride in getting things done fast. Implementers have little patience for talk without action. They'd rather spend time creating a to-do list and checking things off, skipping down. The implementer's challenge is impatience. Implementers may think that anyone not moving as fast as they are is not moving at all. 
Others may see implementers as pushy, insensitive, domineering, or taking over. Letitia finished reading and leaned back in her chair, looking a little stunned. Well, that explains a lot, she reflected for a moment. When I ran the marketing committee, I guess I just took over. I got impatient at the pace things were going. I started doing the work myself. Letitia's smart. It's one of the things I like about her. She understood where she fell down. On the marketing team, her preference to implement overcame her. Instead of relationships, she focused on tasks. Instead of working with people, she bulldozed over them. If people couldn't keep up, keep up, so be it. She'd do the work herself. But no one can keep up with Letitia. Have I mentioned how fast she bikes? When someone is constantly outpacing you, you start to feel like a plotter. When they take over your work, you get the distinct impression they don't think you're up to the task. You wonder if indeed you are up to the task. From there, it's a slippery slope to quiet quitting. When Letitia read the description of her foresight thinking profile, she got the memo. She didn't want to lead another disengaged team and relive the stress and isolation she felt as marketing chair. It had been miserable for her and everyone else. She sat up straight and said, I want to do my next leadership role differently. Do you think it's possible? Totally possible, I said. I was once right where you are. I get what you're up against. I prefer to implement too. Really? She looked surprised. How do you create such a strong sense of community? Your volunteers are so committed. I built that community by design, I said. I told her the story. Once I worked with a guy named Joe, a Harvard grad, who used to walk into the library and pull random books off the shelf to read them. One day he was paging through a book about the human hand and saw a small black and white photograph from the 1950s. It depicted a bunch of guys huddled over a car engine with their sleeves rolled up. They were up to their elbows in grease. The book explained, community is created by putting hands in. Letitia paused, not seeing the connection. That's it. That's the secret, I said. Get people to roll up their sleeves and put their hands in. Ask them to contribute. Give them a challenging task that fits their skills. The more elbow grease, the better. That's what creates a sense of community. Letitia started taking notes. I continued, my mother-in-law did it by throwing potluck dinners instead of formal dinner parties. She said, when you throw a potluck, everyone shows up because they're responsible for bringing part of the meal and they always have more fun. When people feel needed, they want to contribute. When they contribute, they feel part of something bigger. It's a virtuous cycle. That's the strategy behind everything we do on the parent volunteer committee. The hands-in strategy was so obvious to me now. I'd seen it work over and over as a parent, coach, a volunteer leader, but it's not obvious to all leaders, especially hands-on leaders who prefer to implement. They often have to rise through the ranks. They have often risen through the ranks, winning praise for their ability to get things done. Hands-on is their thing. Hands-in is an entirely new move. Not only is it new, it's also slower, messier, and less reliable. You have to relinquish some control. You have to let others exert some authority. Things don't always work out as you imagine or march to your timetable. You have to be patient. No wonder implementers avoid hands in. They like speed. They like control. They like to set up tasks and knock them down. Sometimes they knock people down who get in the way, but hey, did you see how fast they got it done? Maybe you're like Letitia. You have a preference to implement. You've always considered it your superpower, but recently it's become your kryptonite. You try to delegate, but when others don't move fast enough, you just do it yourself. Taking over feels like the fastest way to get results. Yet as time passes, you see it erode community, undermine the team, and sap motivation, and you get stuck with all the work. That may not bother you, but it's bad for your organization. If you get hit by a bus, everything goes down with you. If you find yourself spinning all the plates, keeping all the initiatives moving forward, leading all the projects, and doing all the tasks, it's time to give your preference to implement a good talking to. Here's the good news. You'll fix it. You just have to put, learn to delegate, actually really delegate on your to-do list. Then go after it with the same persistence you go after everything else. Letitia did it. Armed with new self-knowledge, she transformed herself into a hands-in leader. 
She became president of the school board at a pivotal time in the school's history and successfully led the organization through some tough growing pains. Her secret? Balancing her implementer energy with creating community, developing others, and delegating. When Letitia was head of the school board, it was hands-in from the beginning. I love that story. Yay. So we have a few minutes left and I want to ask you a couple of questions. The first is when you set out to write this book, you know, you, usually there's a, a one expectation and then there's what really happens. So what was, what's one thing from each of you that's been surprising about your author journey? Blair. I, 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 I'll just keep it because I, I thought uh, I thought uh, 12, 16 months max that we would uh, be through it. And it, it's I, I'm I'm glad we took the extra time and that I, I don't think I could have uh, recognized myself saying that three years ago. All right. And how about you, Sarah? I I think the most surprising thing that happened for me is I, as a writer early on, I was very independent. Like if I could do it myself, that was my happy place. And uh, in writing this book, I mean, the influence that you, AJ, have had on what got written and that this community has had on how it got written is really profound. I mean, we really did write this book as a team in so many ways. And that the process therefore became just super rewarding. I mean, I know I was tired, I admit, but I was also running a business and having family. I had a lot of other things going on, but like it, it was a lot. Um, but even the marketing, we decided to do like in a team kind of a way and it's changed all of it for me. And I, I didn't know that was even possible until top three works, top three books. Oh, thank you. I'm actually going to put a, note for Laura and I to follow up with you about what do you mean the marketing was done is doing in a team way we want to know we want to know about how you've decided to do that uh this is the question I ask all authors and it's my favorite question ever uh what is the change you want to see in the world because your book now exists in it the, the world is full of uh big challenges and it's full of uh, personal challenges, uh, community, uh, bigger challenges. And I believe we all need to be making the teams that are up to the task. And I believe we really can do it. Very well said. Do you want to add something, Sarah? I just, I hope this becomes um, a the beginning of, of that movement that Blair described, sort of a good team movement, you know? Like, wouldn't that be amazing if people realize that there's not that much you need to do to go from leading a crappy team or just a like, oh, I'm team to leading a good team. And being on a good team, being part of a good team is so life-giving. And I want that for people. I love it. All right. Tomorrow's the day. Congratulations in advance. We're so proud of you. We thank you for coming to Monday Night Reading. Everybody, please get Sarah and Blair's book. Please get it. Pick it up. Buy it. Buy it for a friend. Review it. This really helps. Thank you for showing up for our Monday Night Reading season. We'll see you in the fall, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.